Good morning and welcome to another FS Club webinar uh, from here in London. And today it is a real delight to have a, an old friend of ours, uh, John Plender, who's long been one of the most famous journalists with Financial Times. And John is here to mull on the subject of the future of reserve currencies, the myth of safe assets. I don't think we could have picked a more opportune time to have such a discussion. Uh, given the various turmoils of all sorts, whether it's uh, geopolitics or conflict or economics. There's a lot out there to talk about. And John is our best guide, I think, uh, to take us through a lot of that. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Xien. And it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars. And I'm only capable of doing so because of what I would call the tolerance uh, and, in fact, the open-mindedness and wide intellectual interests of our sponsors, our many sponsors around the world are extremely good at allowing us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. Uh, and if there's anything that underpins finance, it's certainly money and currencies. And if we're looking at the future of the global reserve currencies, I don't think we could range much more widely unless John has news for us about some new Martian currency we haven't heard of. Uh, but for that, we'll have to have Elon Musk with us, I suspect. Anyway, uh, the format for today is one that I think many uh, viewers will be familiar with, uh, which we frequently do, which is we give John the floor for about 20 minutes, uh, and then there'll be about 20 minutes of questions and answers uh, and comments and observations, which we are expecting from you. So if I might, three quick points of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, yes, the slides are available. In fact, they'll be available during the course of the webinar and they're online. Yes, this is being recorded. And the recording will go up in approximately two working days, so sometime about midday Thursday, if you wish to share with friends or colleagues or what have you. Uh, and finally, please do use the GoToWebinar question facility in your uh, chat area. Uh, that brings the questions to me, and I'll feed them into a conversation with John. John will be getting all of your questions, comments, and observations with your email attached. So if you want to contact him or something, we'll be sure to send that on to him. Uh, and you can you can have all of the all of that there. But please do use that because I'm here with you. I'm not on email or Signal or Zoom or, or anything else. Uh, we're here today on, on this system to chat with John. Now, just to get that chat going, uh, we thought we'd have a quick warm up poll. I'm very conscious that the FS Club community is a fast answer one. So before we start, what do you think is the most important reserve currency today? Is it the euro? Is it the renminbi? Is it the dollar? Is it the yen? Or do you think, uh, somewhat controversially, there really is none at the moment? Uh, we're collating the responses here. Uh, half of the audience have already voted, John. It's a very fast very fast audience out there or very opinionated or maybe both and I think we're just going to close that poll now with uh, most of the audience having voted and you can see here well wow uh, an overwhelming uh, support here for the dollar as the reserve currency at 73 percent uh, 5 percent the yen and 23 percent there is none so a split between dollar and none and I think, John, I'm kind of happy we didn't put in the, uh, the, the whether, whether or not it was sterling, which I don't think would have had a, a, a would have featured at all. Anyway, thank you very much, the audience. And John, if I may, uh, hand back to you. The floor is yours. We're looking forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my starting point this morning is that there is no such thing as a safe asset. The nearest the world has come to such a thing was a British gilt-edged security during the gold standard era. Gilts in the 19th century enjoyed the support of Gladstonian fiscal orthodoxy and Palmerstonian gunboat diplomacy, and it appeared they appeared to offer a perfect and perfectly liquid store of value as well as a source of secure income. But come the 20th century, Britain, as you know, came off gold, thereby demonstrating that the safety in gilts was completely illusory. The term safe asset is nonetheless widely used today. What people usually mean by it is a highly liquid debt instrument backed by a solvent sovereign borrower that can be relied on to hold its value during adverse systemic events. Quintessential safe assets are US treasuries, as you know. Yet if we turn to my first chart, short-term US government IOUs clearly don't satisfy that definition on the issue of value. 
During the twin oil shocks of the mid-1970s, they delivered a negative real return. The same is now true as inflation has soared since the start of the pandemic and we have the geopolitical shock of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The real rate of interest on US 10-year treasuries last week was minus 5.5%. The clearest message in this chart is how unsafe supposedly safe assets are in periods of high inflation. Middle-class people who lived through the Second World War invested heavily in government bonds for their retirement because they were thought to be safe. Well, they were safe in the deflationary 1930s, but in the UK and many other countries, much of the value was destroyed between 1945 and 1980, leaving elderly folk impoverished. Paul Volcker, when chairman of the Federal Reserve, did his best to restore some safety to US Treasuries by launching an all-out assault on inflation. That is visible in the phenomenal hike in nominal interest rates in the early 1980s in the chart, which precipitated a savage global recession. This was accompanied by a sustained decline in bond yields in one of the greatest bond bull markets in history. More recently, the persistent decline in bond yields and thus a rise in bond prices has been driven by a shortage of safe assets. This arose because the growth of the advanced economies that produce so-called safe assets has been slower than the global growth rate, which has been driven disproportionately by high growth, high saving emerging market economies, such as China. These are countries whose financial markets are underdeveloped and cannot absorb a high volume of savings. Much of those savings have been invested by foreign reserves in US treasuries. Before the great financial crisis, these global creditors also invested in what were then perceived to be safe private assets, namely AAA rated mortgage backed securities. Their claim to safety was blown in the credit crunch of 2007, which meant that the pool of safe assets shrank relative to demand. Further shrinkage took place in the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis when markets and rating agencies woke up to the lack of safety in Italian and Greek government paper. At the same time, fiscal orthodoxy in Germany caused the Eurozone anyway to be a very modest producer of safe assets to satisfy global demand. For their part, central banks did their bit to further shrink the pool with their asset purchasing programs known as quantitative easing after the financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. It's sometimes argued that one aspect of the safety in US treasuries is that they are negatively correlated to risk assets and thus provide valuable diversification. Yet one of the lessons we've learned since the financial turmoil of 2008 is that negative correlation has an unhappy way of disappearing at moments of crisis when all assets suddenly move in lockstep. All this suggests that the adjective safe has a very specialized and limited meaning in the context of global capital markets. It denotes a high degree of liquidity and an ability to absorb large quantities of frightened money. Yet as my next chart shows, the US Treasury market's haven qualities are suspect. It has shown a marked degree of volatility since the onset of the pandemic, and volatility has now picked up further in response to the Russia-Ukraine saga. Though Federal Reserve tightening rhetoric at, and also because of Federal Reserve tightening rhetoric and soaring inflation. This heightened degree of volatility, naturally enough, impairs the safe haven quality of the treasury market. Note too that the arrival of COVID-19 saw a broad sell-off in US treasuries in March 2020, in which foreign investors who own about 35% of the treasury market played a considerable part. They made net sales of $417 billion worth that month. My next chart from the IMF 
shows what happened to treasuries in five important episodes of financial stress, including the great financial crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis of 2011, the temper tantrum of 2013, the China scare in 2015, and the COVID-related turmoil in March to May 2020. It's striking that the COVID-related foreign exodus was in marked contrast to the great financial crisis, which saw a global flight to quality into US treasuries. Also striking is that official foreign investors were net sellers in the last three episodes of stress. I think it would be premature to conclude that this signals the end of haven status for US treasuries. If we turn to the next chart from the IMF, it's clear that there were two distinct groups of foreign sellers in the COVID turmoil, Middle Eastern oil producers and Asian countries. The first group benefited from historically high oil prices before the great financial crisis. But in spring 2020, oil prices collapsed to levels not seen in nearly 20 years, and oil exporters' current account surpluses were much smaller than in 2008. I don't think these countries were having to withdraw funds to prop up shaky public finances back at home. The soaring dollar around the crisis suggests otherwise. More likely is that with the extreme uncertainty surrounding COVID, they were deserting treasuries to hold precautionary dollar liquidity. The Asians may likewise have been joining in the general dash for cash. And then of course the Fed stepped in as a market maker and lender of last resort, thus underpinning the haven qualities of the US Treasury market. Yet the pandemic has exposed an uncomfortable truth. The Treasury market is no longer as liquid as it was. The start of 2020 saw a traditional flight to quality into US Treasuries, causing yields to fall. But from March the 9th, 2020, yields snapped back, the market sold off, and turmoil reigned. This reflected two shifts. One was that leveraged traders were playing a much greater role in the Treasury market relative to official investors. The turmoil largely reflected forced selling by these investors, many of whom were seeking to exploit small yield differentials between cash treasuries and the corresponding futures. Other arbitrage trades unwound too at that time. The other shift relates to the identity of market makers in the system. Thanks to tougher capital regulation after the financial crisis, the banks reduced their market making function. The gap was filled by shadow banks, such as high frequency traders and hedge funds, who were fair weather market makers, and many of them pull in their horns at times of market stress. The problem all dealers had when COVID-19 struck, as you can see in my next chart, was that their balance sheets had been bloated by a high level of treasury issuance. The shortage of safe assets had turned into a glut. So they had difficulty absorbing the unwinding of investor positions. Liquidity dried up, so a key benchmark price for the financial system became dysfunctional. And US treasuries are now more heavily dependent on the Fed to retain safe haven status. You wonder whether the Fed will be able to perform in that way uniformly at any time in future. That glut also indicates that the US government debt is running at a very high level. It now stands at more than 120% in relation to GDP. When combined with politicians' extraordinary brinkmanship over the US government debt limit, that could sow seeds of doubt in investors' minds about the readiness of the US to honor its debt obligations. Whether by resorting to formal default or informal default through inflation. For good measure, the old argument that the dollar's reserve currency status and the safety of treasuries is buttressed by robust, resilient and transparent institutions no longer looks reassuring 
after Trump supporters assault on Capitol Hill on January the 6th last year. There is no escaping the polarization and dysfunctionality of US politics. Now, if you think that all that sounds like the death knell of the dollar as the dominant reserve currency and of treasuries as the world's greatest bolt hole for nervous money, I invite you to think again. Throughout my lifetime, people have been declaring that US financial hegemony is coming to an end, but it's never happened. The reason is that in this global financial competition, everything is relative. The question is who offers the least unsafe assets for global investors and what is the alternative to the dollar? The most obvious competition of the dollar and treasuries comes from the Eurozone. Yet the Eurozone lacks a deep and liquid government debt market, while countries like Germany, as I said earlier, are not prolific producers of safe assets. The Euro has also been subject to existential threats as in the Eurozone debt crisis a decade ago, which is definitely not the case with the dollar, at least not in the modern era. Then there is China, which has grown much faster than the US in recent years, to the point where it is, as you know, the world's second largest economy. It aspires to reserve currency status and has a big government bond market that offers higher yields than US treasuries. But the Chinese government is more heavily indebted than the US government and its growth model is going through ructions because of a heavily over leveraged property sector that has been contributing a substantial chunk of its economic growth and will contribute much less in future. The currency is not convertible and a move to fully liberalize financial markets is problematic because it would weaken the Communist Party leadership's control over the economy and over the financial system. Whether a totalitarian country could support a major reserve currency is anyway moot. There are no formal checks and balances in the communist system. The legal framework is weak. The political process is utterly opaque and the state intervenes randomly in markets. The story in my next chart is that global capital does not see China as a predictable, low-risk destination offering a store of value. It shows that in the fourth quarter of 2021, 59% of global foreign currency reserves were still denominated in dollars, 21% in euros, 6% in yen, and 5% in sterling. The renminbi amounts to less than 3%. So where, you ask, does this leave us? Well, currently, there is no shortage of safe assets because of the fiscal pump priming that has been required to address the pandemic. The US and Europe have had little difficulty in absorbing emerging markets' high savings in this recent period. But in due course, if US growth falls short of global growth and the Asian economies continue to outgrow and outsave the big advanced economies, the shortage will re-emerge. And that will leave us with a catch-22. To meet the continuing demand for safe assets, the US government will have to run yet more budget deficits, and to do so from a very high current level of debt. That, as I suggested earlier, could lead to worries about the credit worthiness of the government. This carries an echo of the problem confronted by the US in the 1960s, the so-called Triffin Dilemma. This described the problem that arose under the Bretton Woods semi-fixed exchange rate system when the US was committed to exchanging the dollar holdings of foreign central banks for gold. The Belgian-born economist Robert Triffin worried that the US government's ability to honor this obligation was threatened once the dollar liabilities of the US exceeded its gold holdings. Richard Nixon addressed the problem by severing the dollar's link with gold in 1971, a de facto default, which unleashed a period of extreme dysfunctionality in monetary policy across the globe. 
That is a worrying precedent that bears thinking about, an indication of potentially serious trouble ahead in the light of the new Catch-22. On top of this, we now have the Russian invasion of Ukraine, to which the West has responded with severe economic sanctions, including cutting off the Russian central bank's access to its own reserves. More than half Russia's $469 billion worth of reserves have been frozen. It's a little early, I think, to make confident statements about what this could mean for the management of global reserves and currencies. But central bank reserve managers, we surely know, will currently be reviewing their holdings and considering their alternatives. My guess is that the weaponization of the dollar will slow what is already a very slow take up of the renminbi in official reserves, not least because China may become subject to secondary sanctions. But it will also strengthen China's resolve to pressure its trading partners into settling obligations in renminbi rather than dollars. Russia is clearly thinking along these lines in trying to force the Europeans into paying for their energy imports in rubles. It could be that the world will move towards two monetary systems, a dollar block that would include the currencies of the G7 countries and friendly satellites, and a renminbi block, including some of China's main trading partners among the merging markets, and of course, Russia. But there is a complicating factor. How will digital currencies affect demand for the dollar? This is a new, and I would suggest at this point, unfathomable unfathomable issue. What will not change though is the fundamental calculus surrounding reserve currencies. The imperative for official reserve managers and other investors will continue to be countries that offer the least unsafe, least shallow, least illiquid capital markets along with the least shaky institutional and legal frameworks. I believe that reports of the demise of the dollar and the haven status of US treasuries are more than a little premature. The gentle decline in the dollar share of central bank reserves from 71% in 1999 to 59% today may continue, but I don't expect the dollar to lose its preeminent role anytime soon. John, that's fantastic. <laughs> what a wonderful survey of so many things and pulling it all together into such a strong thesis. Um, just a couple of small points, if I might. Um, you mentioned uh, digital currencies. Were you distinguishing uh, central bank digital currencies from crypto or did you see that as a, a block in its own I, right? I, 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 no, I, I think it's the central bank digital currencies that matter in the context of official reserves. I don't, I don't see the private uh, side being able to satisfy the requirements of people who are looking for, you know, um, uh, reserve currency safety. Okay. And you also use the, the term weaponization of, of the US dollar. Could you just expand a little bit about what you see as weaponization there? Well, weaponization is that the dollar is used in so much of global trade in uh, so many um transactions, both official and private, that if you, you know, if, if the United States decides that it wishes to use the dollar in the form of sanctions, and it's done this uh, on many times in the past um, to, to, to penalize countries that, um, that, that uh, you know, are pursuing policies that are contrary to the U.S. interest. Um, I mean, if you think back, for example, to um, the 1950s and 60s, the, the, the rise of the, you know, the euro bond market and uh, the euro markets more generally was a response to the fact that um, the US weaponized the dollar uh, in, in the context of the Cold War. Um, and it, it, but what's interesting now is that the dollar has been you know, the U.S. has pursued sanctions in relation to particular countries, whether it's been Iran or South Africa or whatever. <clears throat> but uh, 
the, the sanctions today are on a scale quite beyond anything we've ever seen before. I mean, to freeze uh, Russia's um, central bank uh, assets in this way, th these are big sums and the ramifications are huge. I mean, in effect, it's a, a sort of de facto polariz polarization of the world between friends of the US and, and enemies of the US. Um, and that is going to, it's, it's going to be very, very big way capital for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, question here from Clive Bullen. Um, has Brexit harmed the UK's position with respect to sterling? Uh, interesting as we're on this slide right now, or I would indicate if I've read this correctly, the claims in pound sterling is the sort of darker green line. It doesn't look as if it has had an effect. I, I don't see why it should. I mean, it, Brexit, OK, it affects trade, but I don't see that it affects capital flows. Um, the, the gilt market is still a, a very liquid market, um, you know, and, and all right, uh, Boris apart, um, British politics are still relatively stable. Um, and again, I go back to the point that I made in, in uh, my presentation. Everything about reserve currencies is relative. So whatever you think about British politics at the moment, relative to everybody else's politics, they're all quite dysfunctional too. So I think that um, Britain's uh, sterling's role as a reserve currency, small though it is, is not going to get smaller. Uh, I think it's still a valid reserve currency that serves a useful purpose. Okay. And uh, equally, uh, David Giori is curious about your thoughts on the euro. Do you think the euro will be more of a reserve currency over the next decade? Well, I think th there is a, a possibility that it will. It depends very much on um, where Europe is going. But in response to, uh, you know, the, the, the recent crises, um, the, the European Union uh, the, has uh, moved in the direction of um, uh, a, genuine, a genuine Eurozone sort of bond asset. We're seeing the development of a genuine Eurozone uh, sovereign market. Um, now, this is taking place very, very slowly, but I think that unless you take a, a, a dim view of the future of the European Union and you think that, you know, the difficulties, uh, the sort of uh, the, the political awkwardness of um, the mainstream countries vis-a-vis -vis Poland, Hungary, and, and all those difficulties. If you, if you think that is a, sort of uh, suggests that the EU is going to go backward rather than forwards politically, then okay, I don't see that the euro um, is going to be a, a, a better, better as a reserve currency. But if you take a positive view of where the EU is going, I think the euro could actually uh, establish a greater share of the reserve market um, this is coming from me kind of riffing off that a little bit um, going back to that term earlier weaponization you know, could europe for example weaponize the euro by uh, requiring it to be used in trade contracts more widely rather than as it appears to sort of just sit back and say it, it evolves as it goes well that's a very interesting question um the, the, i mean the thing is that the the European Union is not a, uh, it, it's not a, a sort of a single economic decision-making entity in a way that the US or the UK are. So to suggest that it could insist that the euro be used in trade, um, the fact is this is down to individual sovereign nations within the European Union. So I don't really see how that could come about. Okay. Um, Con Keening, whom I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, um, what, what it says, when I started in markets, the orthodoxy was that reserves were held to cover nine months of foreign imports and the billing currencies determined the asset allocation. So it was, you know, much more trade weighted. Uh, the shift to holding massive foreign reserves, Con things, needs to be thought of in terms of their value as deferred domestic investment. Any comments on that observation? Well, uh, yes, it's a very good point. I mean, the, the thing that I would also add is that um, what has changed substantially the the way we think about official reserves and 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 how the, the share 
uh, works out between the dollar and the others is very much to do with the mercantilist policies that have been pursued by the Asian economies. Um, the fact is that the, the big excess savers in Asia are excess savers partly because they've been running uh, super competitive cheap currencies and that has led to this huge accumulation of re reserves and so that sort of runs counter to you know, our traditional thinking about how it was that uh, reserves were accumulated and what their purpose was. Mm. We're going to go through a spate of alternatives in a minute but just before we do so um, I, I had a quick question for you about uh, uh, from Anthony uh, Rowley who's dialing in from Tokyo. John, how far can countries push bilateral trade settlements to avoid using the dollar? Well, uh, Anthony, very good to hear. We haven't spoken for about 50 years. Um, I, th I think that, um, that China is going to push very hard indeed. And because, you know, it, um, it, it, it is very enmeshed in the global trading system and has political clout, I think we will see the renminbi being used much more, um, you know, in, 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 in trade. Um, I think the ruble is another matter. I don't see that at all because I think, you know, uh, to go back to the old uh, saw, in a way, if you think about Russia economically, it's sort of Angola with nukes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that it really has the clout to impose the ruble on its trading partners. But I think certainly uh, with China, that is definitely going to be the case. Okay. I'm going to ask... Um... Peter to launch a poll that you, you suggested about the renminbi and the dollar. And while he's doing that, we do have a couple of comments here, uh, John. Um, Henry Tillman is, is points out that the Belt Road Initiative was already testing uh, digital renminbi. Uh, and he's expecting acceleration. And in your opinion, how long before China or the Belt Road Initiative uh, sufficiently weaken the effects of US sanctions? And Arthur Scully also on this, uh, the digital renminbi is, hasn't taken off in China after its formal launch at the Winter Olympics. Any thoughts on that? I must say, personally, um, Arthur, uh, the Chinese, I believe, have been fairly clear that they've been doing this as a pilot uh, and weren't actually expecting it to take off, but that's my understanding. Uh, and while we're just doing that, we're just going to have a quick uh, close there of the poll uh, as uh, over, over uh, almost all the audience has voted here. And as you can see, uh, a tremendous amount of impossible to tell and highly unlikely uh, that we're going to be seeing uh, the renminbi replacing the dollar as the dominant global reserve currency, at least according to the audience, John. But back to that. Yes. So, uh, Henry, on uh, you know, do, do you believe that uh, the Belt Road Initiative might weaken U.S. sanctions? And Arthur Scully, any thoughts on the uh, future of the digital renminbi? Well, I think on the Belt and Road uh, uh, Initiative, my suspicion is that that may be unhelpful to the Chinese in terms of promoting their, you know, desire for the renminbi to be to have a bigger share of uh, global official reserves, because um, a lot of the countries that uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative embraces are very heavily indebted, um, and uh, and and are going to have difficulty servicing those debts and you've seen it already with Sri Lanka which has defaulted uh, on its, its Belt and Road uh, debt and the Chinese have foreclosed and now control a big chunk of Sri Lanka as a result. Um, there's going to be more of that going on and I don't think that is going to be very helpful for the wider use of the renminbi as a reserve currency. Um, mm. But on, on the question of, uh, you know, where does the, 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 the digital renminbi go? Um, I, I mean, my instinct that uh, already China doesn't use cash at all and is probably more receptive to this kind of thing than uh, many Western countries are. I, I would tend to um, be rather open to the idea that um, things might develop very fast and we could all be surprised at what happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely the case. I mean, there's this um, what is it, Amara's law that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run, and things kind of just smash up against you. And I, although your thesis was it could be a long time, I think when it happens, it could happen so rapidly it catches by surprise. 
Um, now, we, I said there were going to be quite a few alternatives, so we'll maybe need to march through these a bit quickly. But uh, uh, there, there is, of course, interest uh, from Peter Walker and Peter Jones. What do you believe will be the role of gold in the safe asset universe? And any thoughts on gold and official reserves? Obviously, it's not a currency, but your thoughts on it as reserves? Well, um, I, I read a piece in the FT on Saturday about whether Bitcoin was going to replace gold um, as the ultimate bolt hole in the global financial system. And, and my feeling was that, um, well, first of all, I mean, I think gold is a 6,000 year bubble, but it's the only bubble in history which hasn't um, seen the supply of greater fools run out. Uh, and I think, in, but, and I think with, with uh, digital currencies, the supply of greater fools will run out. And I think there's also tremendous competition, both now and potentially between different digital currencies. Um, but I th at the moment, I think particularly because we are in a period of rising inflation and great, a great deal of monetary uncertainty, um, I think gold is probably going to hold its value in the short and medium term relative to other assets. Uh, but if you look at the history of the gold price, um, if you know the last time we were in the sort of inflationary situation we are in now was back in the 1970s and early 80s. If you had bought gold in 1980, um, when it had risen enormously in response to the commodity-driven, energy-driven inflation of the time, it would have taken you until uh, you know 20 or more years to to uh, retrieve the value of your capital because the collapse in the gold price was very considerable. So gold doesn't hold its value over the long term, but it provides a useful hedge in the short and medium term in inflationary times. So as far as uh, official reserve managers are concerned, what has happened in practice is that um, around about 2010, having been disinvestors in gold, they started investing in gold again and that tells you that reserve managers in central banks distrusted their colleagues who did monetary policy management um, and stocked up on gold because they had no faith in monetary policy. Yeah, and so to, to, Tim Orchard here, you know, is wondering how how much weaponization is going to tempt people to switch their reserves uh, to gold, uh, which, which is interesting. Uh, Tim Orchard also says gold collapsed because of Volcker. <laughs> Do you see another Volcker on the horizon? But let's. Uh, Let's hold up there for a minute. Um, the next bit, of course, is uh, is to turn naturally in many ways, uh, and I uh, am well known to be a sort of a skeptic about the, the value of private cryptocurrencies uh, at all economically. Uh, but nevertheless, the audience uh, don't agree with me. Uh, so Herbie Skeet here says it's a bit off piece, you know. But what do you think about uh, the fact that uh, Rishi Sunak has asked the Royal Mint? Uh, to bring out a stable coin NFT, non-fungible token. And do you think that uh, Bitcoin or a central bank digital currency will join gold as being perceived as a safe asset? Well, I think you've answered that, but what do you think about the stable coin NFT? Well, I think it's a terrible thing for a British chancellor to invent an alternative to Sterling. <laughs> um, that is not what he should be doing at all. Um, and I find it, well, a, a, a mixture of uh, <laughs> phenomenally amusing and thoroughly disturbing. <laughs> so um, I, I think Rishi Sunak, um, you know, he's uh, he, he's been running out of credibility, having been an extraordinary lucky chancellor at the outset, and this is a, not a good thing for him at all. Yeah, well, I wrote a piece. I think it was back in 2014 with Bob McDowell, who was then the finance minister for Holderday, and it was on you know what's a poor government to do about uh, altcoins, and the point we made there was you should never undermine your own currency because uh, yes. it's your tax system. So I, I'm, I'm with you Indeed. on that. Uh, unless there's something I've missed in the announcements, and I'm afraid they are quite shallow, uh, I, I too share your concern. Um, we then turn to the the store of value issue. Uh, you know, so somewhere circling around all this is this chimera. Is it a chimera at all that there's a store of value? And uh, we've got a lot of comments here, and I'm going to try and pull them together somehow. Um, Shan Turnbull is interested in, you know, could the International oh. Accounting Standards Board define a standard unit of value? Could we create a stable index of value? Lord Stern is talking about sustainability index. That's one area. 
Uh, we had moves, you may recall, uh, back in 2000, and Ian Hillier Brooks online, he was involved uh, around there with the WOKU, the World Currency Unit, which is a, a calculated basket. It's still around uh, uh, that people could, in theory, trade off of, but don't. Um, so, you know, any thoughts on some of these other uh, effectively kind of artificial ones? And may I throw into that, you know, uh, special drawing rights? Well, I think that if you're talking about currency arrangements that involve international cooperation, we are in a period when I think there is a, a retreat from cooperation in everything internationally, except to the extent that it's it's about geopolitics and, um, you know, um, offering a, a common front against military threats. But in economics, I think that we are definitely deglobalizing. We are less cooperative. Uh, cooperative monetary arrangements, it, it seems to me, are off the agenda for quite for the foreseeable future. So I find it hard. I mean, Shan is a great creative thinker in these areas, but um, I, I feel that this is not the time. Uh, we're not going to make much progress on these things at the moment. Okay. Um, uh, about four years ago, um, I was asked, uh, you know, what I thought of, uh, you know, the black market in crypto. And I said, well, actually, it's probably more the gray sanction busting market I was interested in. And I postulated then that, in fact, Russia might come up with, for example, a backed uh, Petro ruble. So uh, it uses the crypto trading systems to trade it, um, but without necessarily the consensus mechanisms. And that it's avoiding sanctions by having a backed currency. So there is a, there's actually a barrel of oil sitting there. Um, this popped up, of course, in, in the case where Venezuela sort of vaguely said it was going to issue a Venezuelan uh, petro dollar and it was going to be based on its reserves. I was talking about a much more concrete, there's a barrel of oil for every token in circulation and you either do or don't trust the Russian central bank. So all this is uh, starting to come up as, as things. Of course, it was interesting that it was the uh, Russian uh, government that was going to provide the Venezuelans with their system, uh, which I thought is a bit of a, an experiment or a thought experiment. That's kind of a long wind up uh, to the fact that, you know, do you think that some of this uh, is not really about reserves currencies, but uh, as, as much as the weaponization? So Tim Orchard here uh, points out that the US dollar uh, ruble FX rate suggests that sanctions on Russia aren't really working. Uh, and in fact, that most of the world hasn't actually imposed sanctions on Russia. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, on, on, on the ruble strengths, I mean, I think that's substantially to do with the fact that uh, Russian exports are obviously going gangbusters, but imports have collapsed. And that's why the ruble is strong. It's not, not got anything to do with anything else. Um, but I think that um, the, the interesting thing about what you're saying, Michael, is that we're, financial markets, um, uh, the, the investment bankers are huge hugely sophisticated, their ability to innovate in and, and to do regulatory arbitrage is extraordinary. We are in the kind of situation where if you're going to get a polarization, a, a dual monetary system between the, the West and a, a sort of renminbi-based uh, block, then um, it seems to me entirely plausible that you could get um, securitized uh, sort of assets, which um, would uh, you know um, it, it would be back to the um, the euro markets that kind of arbitrage away from the dollar um, yes I think you could see um, securitized assets of the kind you're suggesting and I think that some, that is entirely plausible it's something that could well happen well I've just uh, launched on the final poll so folks uh, pl please click in there although as ever over 50 percent have voted very quickly um I'll just leave it open a few more seconds there uh John we we have sadly run uh, to the end of time um and there are a zillion comments here which will all be sent to you um so folks uh, all of it, we'll get we'll, we'll get to John I'm just going to have a quick close here uh, and I must say, uh, it is interesting to see that the, yet again, the, the dollar um, uh, sits, sits up here very strong. In fact, the dollar 
is those of you who uh, remember the original poll is actually stronger after this conversation than it was when we began, uh, which I which I think is uh, pretty interesting. So we we are all uh, perhaps uh, victims of not paying a, enough attention to Amara's law. Uh, there are a lot of other comments here. Con Keating pointing out that a lot of what we're talking about uh, means that cyber warfare becomes a larger threat if we're going to be doing all of this sort of stuff digitally, uh, which is I, I think is a, is a very good point. And we could we could go on, but uh, John, all I can say is an enormous thanks for sharing such considered thoughts and over such a period of time, uh, which I think is important for us here who like to take the longer term view of finance. Uh, rather than whatever the short-term issues are. And I, I, I really appreciate the effort that you put into this and the fact that you were kind enough to share them with us, and we really appreciate it. Um, I'm afraid that we have no uh, sophisticated technology, uh, and and so this is uh, my Korean karmic clapper. Um, <laughs> if I could, I would, I would pay you in Korean won or something, I suspect, but I will use this on behalf of the audience to give you applause. And I'd like to thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Michael.